Thank you all for joining us today. This show is dedicated to the honor and the legacy of the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, truly an icon for equal justice in the eyes of those who sided with her and even those who sided against her like Justice Scalia. Uh, we have the honor of having with us today Dean Camille Nelson of the William S. Richardson School of Law of the University of Hawaii, retired Judge Sandra Sims, senior attorney and criminal defense expert Bill Harrison, and legal scholar and expert on inequality and incarceration, Ray Dean, Kiahi Laulu. And today, I'd like to start us with just a short quote from RBG. I see my advocacy as part of an effort to make the equality principle everything the founders would have wanted it to be if they weren't held back by the society in which they live, and particularly the shame of slavery. I don't think my efforts would have succeeded had it not been for the women's movement that was reviving in the United States and more or less all over the world at the time. So rather than try and rehash RBG's life and career. I'd like to pose to each of you your thoughts, your feelings on what she most would have wanted us to be thinking about, caring about, understanding, believing, and acting on at this time. Dean Nelson, want to start us off? Sure. Well, thank you very much for including me. This is my first occasion to be with you all, and I'm really grateful. So thank you for that. You know, one of the things that I think about are the ways in which she, with grace and with inclusive notions at their core, allowed us to dream about what a better world would look like. And it's a hard thing sometimes to think, what would justice for all look like? Like if we actually think about that now, what would that look like for everybody? It forces us to think about who's not at the table, whose voices don't carry quite so far. And I think her jurisprudence was crucial to that possibility. And I also wanna emphasize the grace and the civility as demonstrated by her friendship, durable, long-standing friendship with Justice Scalia. Because I think one of the things we have to think about, especially now in this moment of, you know, tendencies to shut things down and urging to, you know, cancel and just not listen and to create this point where we don't even entertain conversation with people with whom we might disagree, that she so profoundly stood for those engagements and ongoing conversations and the possibility of friendship despite difference. And so I want to I want to lift that up as well as we think about her as um, a visionary legal activist in some sense as well. Thank you. That's a great place to start. Sandra, Radin, Bill. Well, Chuck, you know, um... I think she prided herself as, as being a teacher um, and she talked um, to students a lot and we had the, you know, the wonderful um, occasion to have her here uh, at our law school um, in residence and um, she clicked with the younger folks and uh, that I think is, is, is a big part of what she, uh, she stood for and what she wanted to do and, and as you know and it's clear that, that she became an icon um, being notorious. <laughs> and I think that that is a special uh, relationship that she had. Um, you know, growing up, it, you know, in the 60s, um, we had civics class and we um, knew some of our uh, judiciary, the Supreme Court. You know, if you asked me when I was uh, in school in those days, if I could name Supreme Court justices, I would have a hard time uh, being honest with you. But um, because she was such an icon and because um, the... Um, the younger uh, crowd um, uh, loved her. Um, you know, she she brought the Supreme Court into uh, our kids, you know, minds and mindsets and, and understandings. And I think that's a, a great thing that she did. 
Um, and, and we know about her positions in equality. We know her, about her position, positions on race and, and, and other positions. But I think that that's a special quality that she brought as a Supreme Court justice. And I don't think that there's too many uh, of our justices in the past that could actually, um, you, could, you could cite for that type of a proposition. Exactly. Sandra, your thoughts? Oh, I'm sorry. I have to agree with you on that. I think that's one of the things that kind of jumps out at me as well. I'm sort of from that generation that's closer to when she started, when I began um, law school. Like she had already, you know, made some inroads, but um, there weren't that many, you know, black law students or or uh, female law students at my law school as well. And so that was a big, big change that was happening uh, during that time. And it was kind of nice to sort of have these women in front of us. Uh, that were kind of showing a way that you could imagine. But I think I, I, I really am moved by her connection to young people. That mm -hmm. too, I would agree with you on that, Bill. I can't, I can't imagine, um, again, growing up, seeing someone of that stature that could just, you know, relate to young people in such a way without it being a family member, you know? <laughs> <laughs> your aunt or uncle or someone who's doing, you know, doing that. Um, I note that that is, <clears throat> I know she spent a lot of time here at our law school, but I think some folks don't realize she actually came to the high school here in Mililani um, mm. and spoke there as well. So I don't know that uh, certainly in my um, high school experience, the ability to kind of connect and talk to a Supreme Court justice, or even just an Illinois justice, you know, a judge at, at the school was just something that's totally far-fetched that made the system seem so far away and so out of touch. But I think one of the things that she may be bringing to us, and certainly by this outpouring that we are seeing of, of affection and care, and even just the, you know, the little girls wearing their mm -hmm. Superman, Superwoman um, costumes with their collars around shows, that they're ready to kind of embrace this whole notion of at least having an inkling of understanding what justice is. And so they can begin to, you know, grow into that and carry that, at least carry that symbol, that knowledge of her being something that represents justice into the future. So I, I guess I'm big on, I'm thinking our young folks are gonna save us. <laughs> Somebody's gonna save us. As the youth core of our group, <laughs> what, what's the what's the impact for you? What's the greatest force of her legacy for you? I, I think for me, you know, I've really been reflecting on what makes a true icon. And I think we've this year and most recently, besides uh, RBG, um, we've lost some huge trailblazers. And, you know, what I've been thinking about was the content of her character and um, how she similarly exhibits, uh, I think a level of courage that probably would test the average person uh, and a singleness of focus uh, along with integrity. And I think um, Dean Nelson talked about her grace and that's, that's not an easy feat for one human being and, and I'm sure that um, you know, she was up against uh, a lot of people who were not in agreement with her values, and yet she stayed the course. And probably uh, it came with a lot of sacrifice, personal sacrifice that we don't even know about. And so for me, that kind of legacy is something that um, I'd like to see more of, especially in this day and age when so many of our leaders and organizations and government structures are, are um, just, you know, dis destructing right now. And those values are being lost. But she's, she was an incredible person. I mean, I just cannot imagine the level of impact that she's made is going to last for decades, if not centuries, you know. <laughs> That's, that's what we're all hoping. And yeah. I think the emphasis on the courage and the grace calls to mind an old Hemingway quote, which is courage is grace under pressure. Mm. If anyone exactly. exhibited it, she, 3% of the women in her law school class 
of, of the students in her law school class were women. Mm. She graduated at the top of her class, started in Harvard, finished at Columbia, was turned down for a Supreme Court clerkship because she was a woman. Hey, and yet earned her way to a Supreme Court appointment, which had almost no negative votes in the right. US Senate, even yeah. with her strong liberal political background. So her ability to not only have the courage, but to earn the respect. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. That balance, I think, is almost unique. And she is now the first woman in US history to lie in state yes. at the US mm -hmm. Capitol. Yes. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I want to, as an educator, I want to tee off on top of that is when I said, you know, that the sort of activist activist, right? Her work before being appointed to the bench mm -hmm. demonstrated the excellence of her legal skills. I mean, her chops were unassailable. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the fact that she was um, you know, came through with such support to the highest court of this land is underwritten by the fact that she was an exceptionally talented lawyer mm -hmm. and advocate. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I don't want for that to be lost because right. it was because of that as well that she was able to so exceptionally execute on her vision for this country through her jurisprudence. I think that's a really, really important insight, Dean. And it calls to mind something about Ruth Bader Ginsburg as a person that was so able to use that combination of qualities and courage to earn not only the respect, but the deep affection of mm -hmm. people like Justice Scalia. Yeah. Who could, who could be more politically opposite than her? Totally. And yet what a pairing. And she and her husband, Marty, that story really needs to be told at some point. Another it's <laughs> emblematic of the very best. So her relationship skills, mm. together with all of her academic skills, her professional skills, all of the other things, that I think strikes us as a unique combination and model mm. for all of us, any age, any background. Mm -hmm. It's a universal model as a person. Yeah, I have to agree with that. I wanted to kind of add to that in terms of her advocacy along with that integrity made it so that, like I said, that people who didn't agree with her had no qualms or no hesitation to vote to confirm her because they knew that when we understand what the justice system requires, that she brought those skills. And it wasn't about ideology. And I think we've sort of gotten so twisted, I guess, in mm. looking at, at ideology as a determining factor in what makes a what makes for a an icon and a justice. And it's not that. It's it's going to be those skills that she brought to the table to begin with. Similar to what, you know, what we saw when Justice Marshall was confirmed. He brought those same skills and integrity and passion, you know, to the Supreme Court and still maintained um, the, the discipline and the integrity to do what he needed to get done there as well. And so she is in that same mold to me. And I, and I don't, I don't want to say I'm longing for the past, but it's something that I think is important for us to really try to regain that sense of, of how we can be, um, have integrity and, and, and be advocates and still be decent human beings that can respect each other. Uh, and my God, we're losing that. And, and it scares me um, mm -hmm. sometimes. It just, it, just, it just does. And so I, I'd like to see if that's, if, if she teaches us she teaches us many things, but I hope that's one of the things that really, really begins to come out in her legacy and the thing that people, especially our young people, remember about her that helps us to be able to, to do that kind of 
um, to be that kind of a society again. Mm. And I think that's really important to recognize. We've all heard many times in recent days that her most fervent wish was that her replacement be appointed by not the next president, but the new president. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, she, yeah, even, even in saying it that way mm -hmm. <laughs> reflects that same kind of, yeah, integrity that we talk about. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, that we, we all agreed that she was very frail um, in the last few years. And, but still, yet, because she made that statement that she wanted to be here um, yeah. when the new president came. So you, you believed her, you believed her. And um, it, it, you know, it, it was still shocking that, that we, she left just because she was such a force that we really truly just believed she, <laughs> she was going to be here yes. until someone came that she thought would be appropriate to appoint the next uh, Supreme Court justice. Mm. So that's, that's, just, that's what makes it so surprising that she left us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So what can we do to honor her spirit, her legacy, her wish? Mm. Be the no, best I, we can be. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sandra. Be the best we can be in what we're called upon to do. That's certainly one of the things. Uh, and to do that with some integrity and, 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 and decency, you know, how we handle, how we deal with each other when we, you know, encounter people that don't agree with us. Or, I don't know, just one thing I can think of. I'm sure there are others that you guys have in mind as well. Yeah, and, and you know... <laughs> Right, I'm sorry, Redeem. Go ahead. No, they'll go. Go ahead, Redeem. No, I was just going to say, I mean, I mean, she, obviously she was incredibly brilliant, but there was, there was a level of humility that allowed her, even in the face of opposition, to still be respectful and have a, have a dignity for um, fellow human beings. And that's something that I think for me uh, and a lot of people, uh, we need to remember. Um, because things are not going to always end up as we expect. Um, but that doesn't say that we need to treat the opposing party um, with a lack of dignity. Yeah, you know, we, we need to, to nurture the same qualities that she had um, and invest that in our students that are coming up and the people we're following. Um, you know, she was a perfect role model. She, she um, fought the good fight. Uh, she as counsel of the ACLU, you know, you had to respect her because she appeared before the court. She argued before the court. Yeah. The Marshalls and the Ginsburgs uh, of the world, um, you automatically had to respect those individuals because they took on those fights and they took them to the highest courts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a lot of um, academics. We have other government individuals on the court, um, people who have tried cases, people who have not tried cases. Uh, and you just got to give that level of respect to, to people like, uh, you know, um, RBG, because you know, not only did, was she, did she fight the good fight, but she fought it to that level. Um, mm -hmm. and that kind of respect just, just has to follow you. And we just got to make sure that our, the, the new ones coming up understand and appreciate and, and follow along that and, and make sure that they, they take the same type of uh, um, advocacy with them on that road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are great points. And, you know, I think about our students and prospective students. And sometimes I hear students or prospective students and women in particular, or people who are dubbed non-traditional candidates. And, mm -hmm. and I think we know what that speaks to. That speaks to race and gender and ethnicity and immigration status and religion and class and sexuality and everything that is seen as not the, the attorney from you know central casting as it were. She is not who people usually envision as an emblematic US Supreme Court justice who has had, and I agree with you, will have generational impact. She was on the quieter side. Her voice was not this booming razzmatazz, right? And I want to signal that because so many times prospective students from non-traditional backgrounds wonder whether the law is for them. Mm. And I always say the law is for you. It must be for all of us because your voice needs to carry. 
I want to I want to uplift her in that way as well because I've heard her speak on many occasions quietly and you could hear a pin drop. Everyone was so riveted because of the the brilliance and the brilliance is also part of her hard work and her legal strategy, right? I mean, when you think about the fact that she strategized with some of the gender equality cases to intentionally have male plaintiffs, that mm -hmm. is a combination of legal expertise and strategic brilliance mm -hmm. and knowing her audience that cannot be underestimated in terms of how we have to think about the possibilities for change, right? So it's so multifaceted. And I think she so perfectly brought much of that together so we can learn from her. Absolutely. I think that's a really important point because it takes us right to where you started, Dean Nelson. What is the struggle that she fought for the hardest and would want us to carry on? And it may be exactly where you started us, the struggle for not just equal justice, but equal followed by all of those things that are most important in life, equal housing, equal education, equal employment, equal spiritual freedom. How do we do that in a way that most honors her? I think this is a great start. <laughs> and I know there are so many similar conversations taking place around the country and I'm sure around the world. And, and, and what, a, what a tremendous, tremendous outpouring. Bill, Sandra, Radine. The discussions are taking, I agree, the discussions are taking place. I, well, we heard one earlier today. I mean, we're talking about the same thing. It's kind of uh, um, what's the focus is now having people who heretofore maybe have not communicated or even shared the thoughts or understood the conversation or understood the issues are at least now at the table asking if nothing else, what's going on? <laughs> what happened here? Exactly <laughs> and right. that's a start. That's a start. And from there, from there we take it. And, and Dean, you've got the students there. <laughs> you, you and uh, Dean Conway are, are putting together a, a, new ge a generation of new, of new attorneys who are going to be approaching things from a very somewhat, uh, not a very, but somewhat different, different way than was traditionally done in law school. I mean, that's been evolving right. for years now. That whole process of what law school is about uh, is, is, is been, has been evolving since we have had more women and more non-traditional students become a part of it. It's changing the law. Absolutely. And I, I will just add to that briefly that, you know, I like to talk about us as being in the business of building and supporting the leaders of tomorrow. Right. I mean, that's what I think lawyers are professional problem solvers and it, like it or not, many of us are in ultimately in leadership roles and can make a difference. And I think one of the things, Chuck, you know, the language of one person can make a difference. I mean, look at the difference she has made. Look at the incredible yeah. difference she has made for all of us. And I hope that inspires the leaders of tomorrow, the leaders of law towards a better tomorrow. Yeah, and I was going to say that, you know, this conversation here um, with these three brilliant women just tells you basically uh, what we need, what she has brought to the table and what we need to carry forth. So um, this particular episode uh, with these ladies here, um, I think, encapsulate what RBG was all about. I, Bill, I couldn't agree with you more. I think if RBG were here today, to paraphrase her, she'd be looking at Camille, Sandra, and Radine saying, that's what I'm talking about. I hope so. And I think, I, I think we're on the, on the way there. I, I do. I think the key is for us not to forget. I, I always say, remember, remember, remember. We need to write this into the things that we're writing, the poetry. We need to write it into music. We need to put it into art. We need to remember and carry it forward. Absolutely. You know, and that's another really brilliant point because 
art and culture were such a central part of life and its energy and joy mm -hmm. to her. She actually got to play a role not singing in an opera. <laughs> sure but one of her famous quotes is, if I could have designed it the way I would have really liked with the opportunities I would have liked, I would have been a diva. <laughs> Was. <laughs> she was a different kind of diva. Yeah, she was. Absolutely was. was. <laughs> she was so the diva you wanted to be. <laughs> yeah. she, she definitely was. <laughs> definitely a diva. <laughs> so as we come into our last minute or two here, last thoughts, Camille? I just want to also lift up and celebrate what, what you talked about with her relationship with her, her loving husband and to underscore that the surrounding yourself in love and in life with people who are supportive and, and empowering of your professional pursuits, especially towards the end of justice, can only amplify the, the possibilities. So I want to um, lift them both up and recognize his partnership as well in allowing and not allowing, but supporting the possibility that was this iconic person. Because I think in some cases that's not always there and the, and the eagle can't soar. So mm -hmm. his letting the eagle soar also is part of the work of great allyship and great partnership and great love. And I just want to celebrate that. No, it absolutely is. And it calls to mind another one of her great quotes when she was asked what brought her and Marty together is she said, he was the first man who loved me because I have a brain. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it meant so much more than that. Mm -hmm. As a complete person. As a, yeah, not an, not an appendage. <laughs> In our last minute, Sandra, Bill, Radin, any last thoughts? I, I would just say that she displayed somebody who was all in. Uh, there's no question. Um, and that's what it took for her to make the impact that she did. And, you know, I mean, I think when you are all in and you have that singleness of focus, it, it doesn't have to be a whole lot of things that you're focused on. It can be a narrow focus making a huge impact. So I wanted to thank you all for taking the time and to bring us back to where we started is her courage shown the light for us all to fight for equal choice. And in these times, we are barely more than a month away from some of the most important choices in our lives. May we all have Ruth Bader Ginsburg and her spirit and her courage in mind as we make and see those choices. Thank you all. Well Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor to be part of this discussion. It yeah. really has. It yeah. really and we'll be back in two weeks. Yes. Okay.